Good evening from Kuala Lumpur. Welcome to the third and final day of this conference jointly hosted by the Asia School of Business and the Bank for International Settlements on Digital Disruption and Inclusion, Challenges and Opportunities. My name is Arlene Aguinaldo from the Philippines, and I am part of the inaugural class of the Master of Central Banking Program at the Asia School of Business. We will begin shortly. May I just remind that there will be some time for questions toward the end of our session. You may raise your questions through the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. And you can also like other people's questions, which will push them up toward the top. It is my honor to introduce to you the chair of tonight's session, Governor Noor Shamsia Mohammed Yunus of Bank Negara, Malaysia. Governor Shamsia joined Bank Negara, Malaysia in 1987 and has served as governor since 1st of July, 2018. Throughout her tenure in BNM, she has served in various areas, including prudential regulations, financial intelligence and enforcement, talent management, finance, and supervision. She was also involved in financial sector resolution initiatives during the Asian financial crisis. Prior to her appointment as governor, Governor Shamsia also served as Assistant Director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Division of the IMF. Without further ado, I now give you your share for this evening, Madam Noor Shamsia Mohammed Yunus, Governor of Bank Negara, Malaysia. Hmm. Well, thank you, everyone for tuning in to this third day of the ASB BIS conference on digital disruption and inclusion. Today's session uh, will focus on central banks as enablers. And as what was discussed in the other sessions on day one and day two, pursuing digitalization of the financial sector is an important means for central banks um, to ensure that the financial sector continues to serve its intermediation role effectively. However, there are risks and pitfalls that we need to consider uh, when we pursue digitalization. This is especially true as we want to ensure financial inclusion and financial stability, both important rules for the central banks are met. So in this regard, we have an esteemed panel of speakers in this session here today to explore what enabling role should central banks have in building a digital infrastructure that will achieve both a financial inclusion and financial stability. Um, some of the things that we will cover, I am sure we will, will include uh, issues around building trust, uh, mitigating risk, educating the public, and working with other regulators. There will be a question and answer session at the end where we will be taking questions from all of you. And I look forward to engaging with you and the panelists during this session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for this session, Professor Robert Merton, who is this, uh, the School of Management uh, Distinguished Professor of Finance at MIT Sloan School of Management and the John and Nettie MacArthur University Professor Emeritus at Harvard University. After receiving a PhD in economics from MIT in 1970, Professor Merton served on the finance faculty of MIT Sloan School of Management until 1988, at which time he was the J.C. Penney Professor of Management. Uh, and Professor Merton also received the Alfred Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 1997 for a new method to determine the value of derivatives. So you can read you know, the full glorious uh, uh, curriculum vitae of uh, Professor Merton um, in the pack that ASB has provided for us. So uh, I really look forward from hearing from you, Professor Merton, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And I first want to thank the ASB and the BIS for inviting me to take part in this consequential event. Uh, you know, if, if central banks are going to be multifaceted enablers for creating an environment that fosters both digital inclusion and financial stability, 
they will have to increasingly meet the increasingly faster paced challenges of acquiring better quality data and analysis for early crisis potential uh, detection, policy decisions, and very importantly, rapidly to get a formed and uh, comprehensive feedback on that policy decisions. So going both ways, the policy themselves, but then the feedbacks from that. So I will therefore discuss in my remarks, innovative approach to uh, getting, meeting these challenges and significantly improving the estimation of the probabilities uh, by information extraction from derivative market prices. The traditional approach to forecasting for future market prices and their distribution and their risk properties is to use historical data in a statistical model. So if you want to estimate how volatile the stock market would be in the future, uh, yes, uh, if you want to, excuse me, uh, if you want to, to uh, estimate the volatility of the stock market in the future, uh, you would uh, gather data from the past volatility of what's happened and put it through some GARCH or ARCH model to give you your forecast. Uh, then this is a sort of a simple statistical historical perspective. An alternative to that is to approach, is to use the current prices of options on the market and extract its implied estimates of that future volatility. Now, the reasoning for why this might be an improvement is the following, that current prices, and this is true in all markets, but current prices, those participating in that market who are, of course, what determines the prices, already those players know the past. They have the same models. They have the same data from the past. What they bring when they trade right now is all the nuances, the changes, the things that they see that are different from the past that will influence what's likely to happen in the future. So in addition to all the past information, backward looking, if you like, historical, they have the refinements and reactions and they're acting on those, on those reactions. And so you know, the reasoning would go that this improves the evaluation of the assessment, what will happen by taking account what has changed from the past, okay? So these, these estimates that come from this process of trading right now, that are influence what people do, is called forward-looking, whereas the traditional one is backward-looking. And when there is change, the forward-looking can be quite instructive in picking up on a better estimate, at least in principle. And then I'll talk about some of the empirical evidence on that, okay? Now, because the market price aggregates the partial information of all the players, okay? It obviously gives us information that no one has, no central bank, no sovereign wealth fund. So that's important information from these market prices. Uh, and in, in certainly in the sophisticated markets that we tend to use for this, uh, these, the players in these markets are well informed and motivated to act on the, uh, uh, the um, information they have. So this is a way of saying we can have some reasonably good confidence that these prices are not ones that are just coming uh, you know, from a college professor or taxi driver or whatever. Uh, and, and should therefore expect them to be serious. Um, options are, of course, an insurance contract. They're value insurance. And so their price change will reflect changing risks for the assets that they insure. And hence, they have a potential to serve as an early warning system for potential crisis. The process for the information extraction is well established. What one does is, you take the option price, you set it equal to the Black Scholes Merton, you know, option pricing model, which has six inputs. Five of them you can observe. The only one you can observe is the volatility, the standard deviation, if you like, the, the, the measurement of the risk volatility of the of the underlying asset. Okay. And so by setting 
the market price equal to the model price, you can extract an estimate of what the volatility would be implied by that uh, uh, equality. And that's what we mean by an implied volatility. And that gives us a direct estimate of the, uh, of the thing. So if you'll feel, I'm now going to share some slides with you to quickly show you some, some results and follow on. Uh, I said this, this forward-looking use of markets to get uh, estimates based on current time is, is, is of course long been done in the case of term structure of bonds, where we look at the term structure today, give us inferences about where we expect interest rates, or at least the market expects interest rates to be in the future. Uh, we can also do inflation uh, uh, similarly by looking at the nominal bonds and inflation protected bonds, looking at the differential between them, seeing the break even as in this slide I'm showing you here to get implied uh, inflation rates. Well, while this is a very old and very well used uh, set of forward looking models, it, it basically is used to get expectations. It doesn't tell us very much about the changing risk or at least one has to go a long way to infer that. Uh, and so we would like to use markets, insurance markets, which are focused on that, to be able to uh, take a look at what the uncertainty is uh, surrounding that. So Now, when we do this implied volatility, which is setting the model price equal to the market price to get the market's inference, it turns out that if you're looking as, you know, this is for the VIX, this is the VIX is the best known uh, index of uh, implied volatility that everyone's seen, it's called the fear index, and it represents estimates of future volatility uh, implied by the market for the S&P 500. But there are all kinds of markets where it's done, just the, this is the VIX. And if, what I wanna show you is that for, relatively short horizon forecasts uh, into the future, the option price, the cost of the insurance, what people are paying, sophisticated people are paying in the market for insurance on, in this case, the stock market, uh, is essentially linear in the implied volatility. So when the implied volatility goes from 20% to 40%, that's a reflection that the price for the same insurance has doubled. Okay, so I just wanted to be clear that when you're looking at implied volatility, that's a reflection of the insurance prices and it's real. It's not a uh, hypothetical. Now, the next point I want to make is that there are options of very ma different maturities, expiration dates. That allows us, therefore, to get implied volatilities for different dates in the future and, therefore, basically to get a term structure, not of interest rates, but term structures of applied volatility or risk uh, in future. And this is a picture of one from April of 2020. And you know you can see this is a downward sloping curve. Most of the times you'll see they're upward sloping. But what you're seeing here is that for the next month, you have a very high index of applied volatility. And then it declines by the time you get out uh, oh, seven, eight months, uh, it's, it's nearly, you know, it's down about 20%. So you could do everything you do with the term structure, uh, but you're doing this about the term structure of risk. So you're getting both quantitative forecast of the, what the uh, future volatility is expected to be, but also the time pattern of information resolution. Uh, clearly, if there's a lot of uncertainty that insurance prices are high, um, there's some things to be resolved. If the insurance prices are essentially falling, that's an indicator, at least the market believes, that the uncertainties, important uncertainties reflected in these prices are going to be resolved within this time period. So you get both uh, the level of risk and its change, but you also get an indicator of how long the market is anticipating will take till these uncertainties are resolved. And when I say resolved, I don't mean in a good way. All it just says, for good or bad, you know, either be a storm or there won't be a storm, but we'll know uh, within this period of time. So that's the thing. Now, what I would like to then do is turn to uh, um, an, another slide to show you some of the uh, term structures from implied volatilities uh, 
with the same economic price in addition to estimates uh, from prices periods. So just, just to show you pictures, here's a term structure uh, for the VIX. So that's just for the US stock market. Okay, and this is back in December of the end of December 2019 before COVID was really there. And you see that the curve, without going into detail, both the level doesn't, you can just think of it as the 14 sloping up to 20, is an upward sloping curve, which I would say is probably normal because you normally think, well, you know, more uncertainties can happen the farther out you can go. And therefore, from today's perspective, it's probably not unreasonable to think that there'd be a general trend to have higher uncertainty about future dates. That said, uh, we see what happened by a month later, the, the curve had flattened out significantly uh, here. By February, the end of February, when we now knew something about it, two things had happened. One, you notice that the, the immediate price for insurance had gone to 40, 14, and uh, at 20, it was now at 40, and you have a steeply declining curve where you see roughly the price of insurance about six or eight months out uh, is, is you can buy insurance at half the price. If you wanna buy insurance forward and not be covered for the first you know, six or eight months, uh, you can get it much more cheaply. And that's telling you again about information about res resolution as well as uh, levels. Now at the end of March, of course, the, now you have that the, uh, the, uh, the, the cost of insurance and the, and the uh, implied volatilities are very high, uh, coming down steeply with the same thing. So what I want you to see here, if you looked at a time series, that the, how the shape changes and how you could use this information to extract. Now I'm gonna jump back to, to the great financial crisis and pick just before we had uh, the Lehman uh, and you see again, an upward sloping curve, this scales the numbers around you know, 20 or so. <laughs> By November, uh, post leaving, it was 80. The price of insurance had gone up by fourfold, all right? And again, this is a serious market. This is not you know, some Mimi stock, all right? And, but again, you see this decline, which giving us an estimate there. By March 2009, the rates had come down and so forth. The market had started to turn a bit, but you still have uh, the decline here. And by December of that year, it pretty much had flattened out uh, to do it. So you see a similar pattern, not the same pattern every time because the world is different each time, but same types of things that happen in that crisis. Now I couldn't resist uh, you know, giving you uh, uh, a look at, at where we are today. Uh, now this is not the, I'm not gonna do any tea leaf reading and so forth, but I just took some numbers off for, for the, to this, this uh, presentation and said, look, here's, uh, here's where the curve was in the end of October. Uh, the, the implied volatility was 16, uh, sloping upward to 25, that's normal. Uh, the levels is what the levels are. By the way, the levels just over the past oh, uh, five or 10, 10 years even, but going back, have, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to be as low as 10. And it's the, the, the peak was reached in March of uh, 2020 at 80, some 82, I think, and eight times the, the price for insurance there. These are real numbers. So you can see that there's quite substantial the changing risk going on. And we're able to pick that up. By November of this past year, you'll see that the curve has gone up, the level has gone up by you know, almost uh, more than 50%, but also that the curve is beginning to flatten out and actually get a slight, slight dip in it. The end of December though, it was back. Now see, this is a different pattern. We're not in a crisis yet, <laughs> but what we see by December, it had come back down and it looked somewhat similar to the way it was in October. But then here we are now, and we're back more looking like this. Now, this isn't just jumping around because if you calibrate it with what's going on, and I don't mean just because markets have fallen, uh, but with information that's coming in and out there and so forth, this is reflecting quantitatively and in terms of resolution, uh, you know, what's going on. And this is showing us that quite, it shifts quite a bit during these kinds of times 
And the idea that you can kind of use the history to kind of tell you where it's likely to go, I think is a, is a very rough thing, particularly in times of lots of information change as we see not only in crises, but in times that, like at the moment that we're discussing. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to uh, raise the following question that you should be thinking, fine, uh, this looks good. The theory is sensible. Uh, we see there's lots of interesting numbers, but does it really forecast realized volatility? Do these numbers do as a forecast? Well, I'm not going to go through all the empirical work, but I will mention some uh, actually on, on, on uh, circulated work of my Nobel uh, partner, Myron Scholes, on just this issue, which he was telling me about this past week, which I find very encouraging. Uh, first, he found that uh, when he uses the implied volatility, these numbers to forecast realized volatility in the future, okay, um, he gets a very significant T statistics, uh, very material R squares explaining, if you like, in some sense, the, the uh, amount of variation uh, from that. Uh, he gets numbers on the coefficients that are very close to one. And why that's important is, you know, it should be telling us if it's right, it should is giving us an unbiased estimate. And the coefficient is about being one, which is saying it's just about giving us, the, you know, an unbiased forecast and, and picking up most of it. And finally, I would tell you the following. When you bring back in the historical volatility models, bar charts using the past, and add them to the implied volatility, with one exception, you get no statistical significance from improvement. The meaning of that is that the evidence suggests that all the information about future volatility that you could get from the looking historically using classical you know, standard models is encapsulated in the implied values, the forward-looking ones. And therefore, you get no improvement, no material improvement in forecast by using both. There's nothing wrong with using both, but the point is, this seems to meet the criteria, at least empirically, that we think it should. And so I'm, I'm very, very encouraged about that. Uh, the second question that I might want to raise is, okay, this gives us volatility of the market, some reasonable forecast, that's useful, but what else can you get? And the answer is a lot. Uh, I don't have time here. I'm looking at my, at my uh, 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 clock and I, I'm about to be uh, uh, turned off. So I just want to say that by looking at different strike prices of options as well as maturities, you can get inferences implied uh, up, upside liable, uh, volatility versus downside, the asymmetries in the distribution that could come in. Uh, you can get uh, uh, all kinds of very detailed characteristics of the distribution, all implied from these in a consistent fashion. Indeed, you know, it, you know, this is I applied what you looked at here as a stock market, but of course it can be applied to interest rate markets and so forth. And in fact, if you have the cap and floor market in interest rates, where you have a very large range of strike prices, many, many, many contracts with different strike prices and different maturities you can actually back out and imply an entire empirical distribution, not just the parameters of the volatility, but the whole distribution. And you know, that, that allows us to you know, see very interesting patterns and a very rich set of data for understanding or getting inferences about the future and the way those distributions are uh, treated. Now, finally, in closing, I just want to I show you that you know, in terms of central banks, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis has taken this on as what they seem to be very interested in doing. They uh, have been collecting and producing data of implied uh, volatilities and even uh, implied distributions in some cases when they have enough uh, data and they have been doing this. And again, not just for the stock market, but they've done it for commodities you know, oil and so forth. They do it exchange rates, currencies, uh, interest rates as mentioned and inflation. So you have a very rich set of markets. These are professional markets. These are institutional markets. They're global markets, meaning 
the inputs into these market prices don't just come from the United States or from uh, the Anglo-Saxon world or where, but they come from everybody in the world. As we all know, institutions are basically uh, global when it comes to operating in these markets. And so uh, I believe this will be a very helpful tool for central banks to perform their important roles going forward, not just with respect to stability, but for being better to understand and more carefully uh, analyze and get feedback on what's going on. And particularly so when they announce a policy. You announce a policy, you're getting sophisticated responses very rapidly through the market, not just sort of knee-jerk reactions. And therefore, I think that you will find that that will be very helpful for this purpose. I thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Merton, uh, for your insightful remarks. I now have the pleasure to invite our next two speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Henry Olsen, the Deputy who Governor is of the Riksbank in Sweden. He is also the co-chair of the Regional Consultative Group for Europe and has served as Deputy Governor since January 2015. He is also a member of ECB's International Relations Committee. Our second speaker uh, is Dr. Fernando Rastoy, um, the chair of the uh, Financial Stability Institute, uh, a position that he has held since the 1st of January 2017. Uh, prior, to, uh, movie, prior to this position, uh, he has held other senior positions at the Bank of Spain, including as a deputy governor. They are full, again, their full resume is in the pack that has been distributed to all participants, so I will not spend time uh, reading them again. So I would like then um, to pass uh, the floor uh, to you, Henry, uh, then followed by Fernando. So over to you, Henry. Thank you so much. Uh, I was very pleased when I received the invitation to, to participate uh, in this uh, event. Uh, it's always um, uh, very rewarding to, to be able to, to meet uh, colleagues from around the world and discuss uh, and to discuss important uh, uh, topics. Uh, my speech today will have three parts. First, I will talk about the changing role of central banks in the digital world. The second part, uh, uh, there I will talk about the three initiatives we at the Riksbank have taken to, to change the way uh, the payment system in Sweden works in the digital world. And finally, I will uh, present to you two issues that currently are under discussion. Uh, uh, and we are discussing these things. Uh, we think it's important for going ahead, but we, we haven't decided our minds. I will not tell you right now which these two issues are. You will uh, have to listen to the end of my talk to, to hear about those two issues. So in my home country, cash is disappearing. Here you have a, a time series of, of the, the nominal uh, value of uh, cash uh, in circulation in the, in the Swedish economy. And you see that after an increase uh, sometime around uh, 2010, uh, uh, the amount started to decrease. And if we uh, relate uh, the value of cash in circulation to GDP, then you see a downward trend. And right now we are at 1% uh, of uh, GDP uh, for cash in circulation. So cash is disappearing. People in Sweden choose other ways to, to make their payments. And of course, the, this is a challenge uh, for a central bank. If we th think about the future role of uh, central banks, uh, we will still have a lot to do. Uh, uh, we have an important uh, objective to see to that money retains its value and that uh, money is safe. This is uh, 
things that we need to use monetary policy for, but we also need to uh, seriously consider uh, financial stability. Uh, we need to facilitate safe and efficient digital payments. Uh, uh, here, the central bank central settlement system is one key. Uh, we also need, to, we have a role to regulate the payment system and the, in general to, to uh, make oversight of what's uh, going on. A question uh, that I will return to is uh, if we should introduce the uh, CBDC. And there are also other policies still for us to, to, to pursue in regard to, to make uh, payments uh, safe. There are some desirable features of a na national payment system. Of course, we want it to be safe. We want it to be uh, efficient. We want to, um, uh, it to be uh, inclusive. So digital payments must be available for all. Uh, we want the system to be innovative and we want it to be competitive. And here I think a very important thing is that uh, to make different aspects of the payment system open to uh, many actors, uh, it will become a problem if uh, it's, it's not possible for new actors to enter into the payment system. We also, of course, want to have a payment system that is resilient, uh, that works even if we are in difficult uh, times. One really important aspect of the payment system is not the whole system, but parts of it, some steps of it, are characterized by uh, strong economies of scale. Uh, we also know that uh, there are strong network effects uh, in the payment uh, system. Uh, and this creates uh, the risk of some actors getting market power in the payment system. Uh, so far in Sweden, we have re relied on the private sector for digital payments. Uh, the private sector, the different banks and the other actors, they have cooperated in different ways. Uh, and, uh, but we have also had uh, regulation. But there are severe questions about this. Uh, if um, the present actors cooperate, then uh, there might be a problem openness. There might be a problem of new actors entering into the payment uh, market. So an alternative for a central bank uh, to regulate is to do th things by themselves. And uh, this has raised the question for us whether or not to introduce a central bank uh, digital uh, currency, or as we say it, an e-krona an electronic uh, krona. So uh, I will continue and discuss what we have done and what we expect to do uh, with the record uh, to digital payments. So we have three initiatives. The first, as I said, is uh, that we're investigating whether or not to introduce uh, the e-krona, uh, um, digi a digital alternative to, to cash. Uh, I will talk a lot about uh, the e-krona, but we have two other initiatives uh, that I would like to mention. We have a, a system of instant payments in Sweden, and it has become extremely popular. And this is the one, uh, one of the things that people use instead of using cash, simply instant payments uh, using their mobile phones. Presently, it's run on the Swedish system and it's settled in uh, Sweden. But the European Central Bank has created an instant payment system uh, and it's extremely efficient, cost efficient. And from uh, sometime later this year, we will move the settlement of instant payments from this national system to the European system. We expect uh, this to, to make the, uh, to have all the features that 
I talked about before, efficiency and all those uh, things. And participating in this system will, of course, be open uh, from the side of the, the RICS bank. So, so any actor who wants to, to use the uh, what we can provide for settling instant payments, they are welcome to, to do so. In addition, we are currently trying to investigate if uh, it... Th similar things can be done to cross currency payments. Uh, you know, if you run the settlements of Easter payments in Kroner on the same machines as the uh, instant payments in euros uh, are being made, uh, then I, I think that it's very, uh, a question is very close uh, whether or not it's possible to, to make instant payments from Kroner to euros uh, in a simple way. And we are trying to, to figure out if uh, together with the European Central Bank, if this could be possible. But some more words about the e-krona. So we have been working on this uh, since uh, 2017. Uh, we started with some brainstorming. We have written several reports, as you can see to the right of, of uh, th this slide. Those reports are available from the Riksbank's uh, webpage, so you can download the reports if you are interested. Uh, since 2020, we are working on uh, a pilot study, simply trying to figure out uh, uh, technological solutions, uh, how an e e-krona could work uh, technologically. So we have a pilot study with, with uh, one external uh, company. The pilot, the objective of the pilot is to establish a possible technical uh, solution. At the same time, we are trying to, to figure out uh, some legal issues related to, to uh, the introduction of an electronic uh, krona. Uh, and we would like, in general, to learn about, more about the techno, technical possibilities, but also the challenges uh, that are around for the e-krona. So here you have a timeline. So, so uh, the phase two of, of the uh, pilot study of, of, for the e-krona will end in a couple of months. Uh, we are discussing to uh, extend and uh, develop uh, the technological studies uh, further. And, uh, you know, a couple of years ahead, uh, you know, we will need more time really to figure out the best possible technical uh, solution. You also see um, a box saying a parliamentary inquiry. And parallel to this, uh, there is a parliamentary inquiry working on legal aspects and other things. Uh, and we expect a report from this inquiry at the end of this year. And this might uh, contain important uh, suggestions concerning the uh, Swedish legislation that will uh, directly affect the possibilities of the Swedish CBDC. So some takeaways uh, on the technological side uh, so far. Uh, we have worked trying to figure out if it's technically possible to have offline tra transactions, uh, that is uh, uh, not being uh, linked up uh, to, to the internet. It's challenging to, to get this to work, but we think that it, this is an, a very important aspect of, of uh, uh, CBDC. Uh, this has to do with resilience. There are some privacy challenges. Uh, we don't want uh, it to be possible to, to backtrack uh, um, uh, who did uh, what, except for the legal system. And there are also some uh, performance challenges uh, uh, when you use backchain uh, technology. It's possible to introduce interest rates on, on uh, e-krona. This we have figured out. And it's certainly clear that uh, a CBDC can enhance uh, resilience. There are also legal aspects. Uh, 
the current legislation limits what the Riksbank can do in terms of the CBDC. But as I talked about the, the parliamentary committee, we hope that these issues will be possible to solve. Uh, we, uh, if we look at the present Riksbank law, we can issue physical cash, uh, but it's not clear whether or not we can issue digital, digital cash or not. There will be a new Riksbank Act. We don't know when Parliament will decide this, but probably we will have a new act from January uh, next year. And according to the proposed new act, we will uh, require parliamentary approval uh, to be able to issue an e krona. Uh, and the last uh, bullet, uh, I've already said it, uh, uh, we will get a report end of this year that will relate to this uh, effect. So the final and the uh, third part of my talk, two issues that currently uh, are under discussion. So the first issue that we discuss is the following. Uh, no? Yeah, finally. Should uh, the CBDC bear interest? Uh, if, it's, if there's no interest, uh, then the CBDC will be very cash-like. Uh, uh, it will probably be easier in a legal and technical sense. And it uh, would certainly mean that we would have parity between a krona uh, in a bill and a krona uh, in the mobile phone. Uh, but uh, CBDC uh, without interest, on the other hand, might uh, harm uh, other policy areas like monetary policy. It might affect financial stability uh, and bank uh, intermediation. You can think of uh, that you can introduce caps on how many e krona different uh, individuals and companies uh, could have, but it's a very would be become a, a very complicated system. But on the other hand, if uh, the CBDC is introduced with interest, then it will become a different asset than cash. And that might uh, create problems in itself. This is an ongoing discussion at the Riksbank. The other issue that is related is if you have a CBDC and uh, there is an economic crisis, uh, will the existence of a CBDC increase the risk of runs? Uh, the counter or one or counter argument is that it's really possible and simply uh, simple to run from one bank to, to another in the present system. But on the other hand, negative uh, interest on the e, e krona might reduce the run risk. And then on the other hand, the mere presence of an e-krona might uh, introduce incentives for different actors to reduce the probability of runs. You see here, the, the arguments go back and forth. Uh, some people say that a run into a CBDC might be preferable uh, to a run into foreign uh, currencies. If, and then you are thinking about a small open e economy. Uh, in the end, the Riksbank will always be a lender of last resort, even if uh, an e krona is introduced. So in that sense, uh, uh, we will still have the possibilities of, of avoiding the financial stabilities. And historically, we have no, uh, ex no experience really of, of severe bank runs uh, in modern times in, in Sweden. We have deposit in insurance and we have a tradition of protecting deposits in banks in, in uh, crisis. But this is also a question under discussion. Uh, my allotted time is up and uh, I stop here uh, and I thank you all for listening. Thank you.
<laughs> anyway, uh, so so thank you very much again for the invitation to participate in this event. I am obviously very very honored to to share this uh, session with such a distinguished set of prominent uh, speakers. I think uh, by now different presentations before before mine have already covered much ground on the implications of uh, the ongoing technological dis disruption, including its impact on, on financial inclusion and resilience. Um, I think the, the already vast literature on the, on the topic, uh, and certainly the presentations in this conference uh, stress uh, this complex interaction of uh, and combination of risk and opportunities that the digital technologies uh, bring to the financial sector. Indeed, I think it is remarkable how digitalization is contributed to enlarge the opportunity set of investors and, and consumers, increase efficiency and competition, the provision of financial services, and importantly, make those services available for larger segments of the population. So the, the significant acceleration you know, of the financial inclusion indicators in the last few years in countries like, uh, say, India and, and China, uh, where digital uh, payments uh, have rocketed, uh, have skyrocketed actually in the recent past, is just one illustration of the power that technology has to make the financial system uh, more able to serve the public uh, interest. The disruption created by technology, uh, the new products and the new providers of financial services, particularly big techs, uh, also poses relevant risks for the achieving, for achievement of, of key social objectives such as market integrity, consumer uh, protection, and financial stability. And those are precisely the, the objectives that justify public intervention where markets fail to, be, to deliver them on, on their own. So the establishment of rules and constraints uh, on market activities such as that performed by new tech players in the market of financial services is the most relevant policy tool to address negative market externalities. That normative uh, action should, however, be uh, subject to the principle of better regulation under which public intervention should, of course, be minimized to what is essential, actually, to preserve social objectives. But sometimes regulation needs to, to face uh, relevant trade-offs as public actions aiming at co constraining and risk and, uh, for uh, adequate market uh, functioning may limit actually the ability by private firms, by tech firms, for instance, to deliver services that could otherwise be socially valuable, for instance, as a result of the positive impact on financial inclusion. So in that context, I think it's important to bear in mind that regulation is not the only form of policy intervention that can help correct market failures. At times, a direct provision of services by government-owned uh, companies may contribute to socially desirable outcomes. In the area of digital payments, uh, for instance, experience in countries like, like India shows how public infrastructures may help society to embrace the benefits of technology and facilitate uh, financial inclusion while avoiding some of the risks posed by an ex ex excessive reliance on uh, large private uh, providers. The introduction of central bank digital currency is another example of how well-designed uh, public facilities can help optimizing the net benefits of digital payment platforms for the society as a whole. And we just heard uh, Henry uh, also making a, a very, very convincing case about, about that. So some policy, policy strategies aiming at facilitating an orderly uh, adoption of new technologies in the financial sector should therefore incorporate a good combination of, of regulation and the provision of public infrastructure. While other presentations uh, have focused on the, on the latter, I think my job here is to focus very much on, on regulation. In particular, I would like to share a few reflections with you on how the regulatory framework needs to be adapted in order to preserve key social goals, such as, in particular, financial stability. And to be more concrete, I'll uh, focus my remarks on how risk posed by the operation of big techs could be addressed by introducing adequate rules uh, constraining their practices and modus, or modus operandi. So one of the most important uh, recent developments in the financial industry is certainly 
the rapidly expanding participation of large technological companies, our big techs, in the market for different uh, financial services. So we know that the original specialization of big techs were not on financial activities, but on non-financial areas, such as e-commerce and the provision of different types of technological services through internet. However, starting with payment services, several big techs soon became active in the, in the, in the business of wealth management, lending, or insurance. Uh, in some cases also, they offer regular banking services through licensed subsidiaries or through joint ventures with commercial banks. So as it is now well documented, we know that the expansion of, of big techs leveraged very much on a very unique business model based on technological and particularly data superiority, which allowed them to benefit very quickly from network externalities. We call this phenomenon in the BIS uh, the DNA loop, D for data and for network externalities, A for, for activities. So use this term that was introduced in the BIS annual economic report corresponding to two, 2019. Big tech services have brought efficiency to the financial industry. This is, uh, this is uh, clear to everyone. Moreover, by, by offering innovative products, they have heralded somehow the historical dominant position of commercial banks in some market segments, such as payments, for which a banking license is not actually required. Moreover, in some jurisdictions, uh, big tests have been able to, to make payment facilities and external funding available to firms and, and households uh, who did not have actually previously access to banking uh, services. But of course, the financial activity of uh, big tests does pose some risks for the preservation of financial stability in particular, which may not always be captured with the, with the, with the, with the current regulatory framework. So let me focus. The rest of my presentation precisely on, on that. So uh, those risks posed by the operation of big techs in what respects financial stability come from a few different sources. First is, of course, the direct provision of, uh, to the public of a suite of uh, sensitive financial services, such as payments, credit, or wealth management, and, and sometimes, as I said, deposit taking. So the unsound performance of those activities could contribute to potentially systemic stress due to excessive indebtedness, liquidity mismatches, um, operational discontinuities, and also to facilitate sometimes illegal, illegal activities. Importantly, the, the parallel performance of several of those financial activities alongside the provision of other non-financial services uh, within everything within the same group could exacerbate operational risks and complicate the, uh, their supervision by the competent uh, authorities. Second important source of risk comes from the frequent provision of relevant technological services to regulated financial institutions. Think about cloud computing services, think about, think about uh, other technological services such as data analytics, for instance. So that actually can lead to uh, large third party dependencies and important operational vulnerabilities. Uh, so recent uh, outages, you, can, you have read that in, in the press, in the, in the technological services provided by big techs typically illustrate that, that those risks can be potentially uh, quite important. In addition, uh, risks uh, can also come um, from the uh, dedication of big techs to promote the, or issue directly uh, new means of payments such as the so-called stable coins. So given the complementarity of those new payment instruments with other services offered by big tech platforms to a large number of users, uh, well, this may have actually the potential to replace fiat currency as a predominant uh, settlement instrument. Uh, and this, of course, could actually challenge the integrity of the payment system, consumer protection, and eventually also monetary uh, sovereignty. And finally, and probably more importantly, I think it's important to bear in mind the potential that big techs have to generate significant concentration dynamics in the provision of key financial services. So network externalities that characterize the big tech business models 
can easily lead to continued increase of their size and their business diversification at the cost of, uh, of at the cost of damaging competitors in an increasing number of related market market segments. And it's important to bear in mind that this concentration is not only important from the point of view of competition of market contestability. It's also important from the point of view of financial stability, as this concentration certainly amplifies the dependence of financial system participants on the services provided just by a few large uh, players. So how regulation has actually reacted so far? Um, certainly, we have seen relevant policy actions in different jurisdictions, certainly following different approaches and certainly different uh, degrees of intensity. So far, in general, uh, authorities are following somewhat piecemeal uh, approach, aiming at inserting specific rules in the current regulatory framework in order to contain some of the risks uh, that I have just uh, mentioned. In particular, the provision of, of, of financial services like payments, wealth, management, credit, and the right, right in order than banking or insurance are, are regulated now through an activity-based approach. Uh, so big tech subsidiaries that perform specific regulated activities are subject to the corresponding sectoral requirements, uh, but typically address consumer protection, AML, CFT, and sometimes also operational resilience. In some jurisdictions, authorities are now considering the introduction of a specific regulatory and supervisory regime for large providers of technological services to regulated institutions. That, of, that regime will, of course, affect, in particular, those subsidiaries of big techs that provide uh, this type of services uh, to uh, financial institutions, in particular, cloud, cloud, computing, uh, cloud computing services. However, many of the, of the risks that the activity of big techs generate for the adequate function you know, of financial markets stem from, not, does not stem from specific activities, but from the combination of both financial and non-financial activities that they perform. Uh, their ample array of services are typically anchored on, on shared systems across subsidiaries and on an extensive use of available data from clients obtained throughout all the activities performed by the group. Uh, so risk posed by such interdependencies can hardly be fully addressed by a pure activity by activity regu regulatory, regulatory approach. We have to take into account all those inter interconnections. And this is certainly uh, the case of the prevention of excessive market concentration. For instance, the European Union, the European Commission has put forward a proposal for a Digital Markets Act, which establishes a, a series of specific requirements which must, must be satisfied by big tech platforms or gatekeepers, at least as, as, as to use the term used in the, in the DMA itself, uh, aim at preventing and not only prosecuting exposed anti-competitive practices that could lead to the abuse of, mar of market uh, dominance. So special rules on data use, data protection, and data, data sharing obligations with end users and business users are a key component of, of, of the proposed uh, European DMA. But a similar entity-based approach is being already enforced in, in China, following the rules established by the market regulator, uh, SAMAR, and is also the one considered in different legislative initiatives, which are currently under discussion in the US uh, Congress. Moreover, we have seen recently some initiatives for the development of a specific regulation of entities performing services related to stablecoins. In particular, uh, a US President's Commission, composed of the Treasury and main regulatory agendas, has uh, very recently proposed a bold legislative reform that will require issuers of stable coins to become insured depository institutions and establish concrete rules and a supervisory regime for entities providing associated payment services such as uh, custodial wallet uh, providers. Moreover, this report by the Presidential uh, Commission proposes limiting the affiliation of those entities with commercial uh, companies. Of course, if those proposals uh, are finally endorsed by, by US Congress, the scope for big techs to promote and sponsor stablecoins will be 
seriously constrained. By the way, you have read in the news yesterday that apparently uh, Facebook is giving up in the project to develop a global stablecoin uh, called DM now. In sum, uh, current uh, developments aim at revising the currently existing activity-based regulation and add a few specific entity-based rules, particularly in the area of competition, to deal with some of the risk posed by big players. So far, however, uh, there is no ambitious attempt uh, to consider a more comprehensive approach to, that could aim at addressing in a consistent manner the risk posed on different policy domains by the combination of activities that big techs perform as implied by their unique business business A model. So can we do it better? Well, it's fair to recognize that at present, there are no internationally established regulatory categories or, or standards aiming at addressing the risk posed by the combination of different types of financial and non-financial activities within the same group. Probably the closest reference uh, is uh, the notion of financial conglomerates. So following the publication of the report by the so-called Joint Forum back in 2012, uh, jurisdictions established rules and supervisory practices aiming at strengthening the prudential regime of entities which are active in more than one regulated financial sector, uh, understood as banking, insurance, and securities uh, markets. One specific type of conglomerate rules are licensing frameworks for financial holding companies, FHCs. Those are typically large non-financial companies that hold controlling uh, participations in two or more financial firms that offer regulated uh, financial services across sectoral boundaries and, of course, exceed some minimum uh, thresholds. So the, uh, this FHC, the financial holding company, and the financial institutions it controls make up what we call a financial holding group, which basically conducts financial activities. And indeed, the non-financial activities performed by this by the groups are typically limited to uh, maximum uh, maximum thresholds. In China, the, the central bank, the People's Bank of China, is, is now requiring companies that control two or more different types of financial companies, including big techs, such as Ant and, and Tencent, to apply for an FHC license. The Chinese regime uh, establishes requirements for the parent FSC company in terms of minimum profitability, financial capacity, and owners' fit and proper conditions. It also promotes uh, sufficiently simple corporate structures and imposes a specific, a specific governance procedures, including the centralized uh, management of all relevant financial risks across uh, different firms within the group. The regime also entails the fulfillment of consolidated capital requirements at the group level and includes constraints on related party transactions and cross subsidiary uh, interaction. So certainly the FHC regime goes a long way uh, towards satisfying the quest for a comprehensive uh, entity-based regime for big techs which are active in the market for financial services. That regime, however, the specific regime as it is now uh, designed, may fall a bit short of addressing relevant, relevant risks. So, as we have discussed before, challenges posed by big techs uh, for the preservation, for instance, of financial stability or more generally adequate market functioning are associated to the combined provision of different types of financial and non-financial services as part of their unique business model. So that entails using common technological and data uh, and data infrastructure for the provision of those different services. So notice for instance that, that, in, uh, that in, in, in some jurisdictions, in particular in Western countries, actually the non-financial activities of big techs are actually more important than their financial, the financial businesses. Therefore, the, the grouping of, of all subsidiaries offering financial services under the same holding company may not be enough actually to control you know traditional risks as well as different forms of data or, or market abuse furthermore uh important to stress that payment services are not uh, explicitly included in the definition of financial holding companies in existing regulatory frameworks so given the crucial role that payment services play 
within the big tech ecosystems, um, and in particular as an enabler uh, for the provision of complementary financial services, a greater focus on payments uh, could be added actually to an eventual reform or revision of the financial holding company regime if we want it to uh, be more effective to achieve actually its, its objectives when applied to large technological uh, groups. In any case, I think the FHC uh, regime seems a quite a useful reference for, a, for a policy reflection uh, on how best regulate uh, big techs uh, with the aim of preserving uh, financial stability and other relevant uh, social goals. Uh, yet that, that reflection should consider how this regime could be adapted to cope with the unique business model of big techs and the key role played by their payment infrastructure. So let me let me now finish a uh, few general remarks here. Uh, I think uh, the disruption that technological technology is creating on, on the market for financial services is probably unprecedented. Many people will agree with that statement. It's clear that the new developments are changing dramatically the, way, the very nature of the services offered, the diversity of, of both users and, and providers, and the way the latter, those, those providers actually perform their activities and distribute the products that they, they offer. So in that context, I think that the, the public policy response to such a far-reaching disruption should be commensurate to the magnitude of that disruption. So that entails both the public uh, intervention, direct public intervention to provide the required infrastructure to fully grasp the benefits associated to innovation, as well as an overhaul of the current regulatory framework. But frankly, the current regulatory setup, current normative setup consistent of a series of activity-based requirements accompanied by specific rules for only for traditional financial institutions is simply not fit for, for purpose. In particular, the potential implications of the activities performed by big techs in the market for financial services require the establishment of a consistent set of entity-based rules spanning over different but related uh, policy, policy uh, domains. And for that purpose, we may require first brand new regulatory categories, but also supervisory procedures able to address the challenges posed by big tech's uh, unique business models, including effective mechanisms of coordination among financial data and competition authorities. Of course, the good news is that some relevant policy actions are already taking place in several jurisdictions. What we need now is essentially sufficient ambition, policy impulse, and international cooperation to make those efforts uh, more comprehensive and hopefully, hopefully also consistent at the global at the global level. So let me stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Fernando. Uh, before we move on to our uh, the next part of our discussion, I would like to remind all participants to use the Q and A uh, function at the bottom of your screen, and and to use the Q uh, Q and A function and not the chat box for questions. You can also like other people's question and that will push uh, the question up the rank. So I will now um, move on to the next section of our discussion where I will uh, invite uh, Mr. Ravi Menon and Mr. Eddie Yu, who does not require any uh, further introduction. Uh, Ravi is the Managing Director of the Monetary Authority of Singapore since 2011 and he was recently appointed the chair of NGFS. So Ravi, congratulations on your new appointment. And Eddie uh, is the chief executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority uh, from 1st October 2019. Uh, 2019. And both have had you know, very esteemed background um, in uh, the uh, respective organization and the wider government. So you can read about their uh, very uh, impressive uh, resume um, in, in the uh, pack that has been, been given um, by the SB. So Ravi, I will pass it to you. Thank, thank you, Shamsia. Thank you very much. You're too kind. And uh, let me also uh, uh, extend my thanks to the uh, Asia School of Business and uh, the uh, 
Bank for International Settlements for the opportunity to participate in this conference. Um, uh, I think some of what Fernando said towards the end uh, provides a good segue for me to uh, uh, go a bit deeper into, uh, into what I would call uh, foundational digital infrastructure. Um, we know the dominance of big tech and the uh, control they have over many digital infrastructures. Mm -hmm. I want to now lead on to what central banks can do to create foundational digital infrastructure that are public goods that will enable a digital, uh, a digital inclusion, financial inclusion. So if you look at um, the situation today, there's no doubt that uh, digital solutions have uh, enhanced the, the economic social well-being of millions of people around the world. But many of these solutions are fragmented. They're not interoperable and they're not seamless. So digital transactions are not seamless. So we're not exploiting the full efficiency benefits of digitalization. It also means that the digital economy uh, is not as inclusive as it should be. So to create a truly efficient uh, and financial inclusion, uh, we need foundational digital infrastructures, systems that allow different users, different solutions and different devices to seamlessly interact with one another. Um, so foundational digital infrastructures will enable interoperable solutions. And you can have digital services that are provided seamlessly to reach more people, more businesses at lower cost, greater convenience. And then you have more pervasive financial inclusion within and across economies. But just an analogy, you know, in the old days, you had physical infrastructure like railroads that helped to advance the industrial economy. Today, we need the equivalent of that in the digital economy. You need digital infrastructures, the highways that are going to connect uh, people. And that is, I would argue, a public good to be provided by governments. And I would, I would focus a bit more on central banks. So I want to touch on four quick uh, foundational digital infrastructures. First, a digital identity. To transact, you need to establish confidence and trust at both ends of the transaction. So it enables access to all the public and private digital services across different sectors. And that is what promotes financial inclusion. Now, a digital identity can be centralized or decentralized. Um, it can be provided by the public sector or the private sector, but you need some form of digital identity or identities. Um, now, how it is de designed will of course depend on the country's uh, institutional legal frameworks, uh, digital literacy, and cultural attitudes towards issues such as privacy and security. Um, in Singapore, we have um, the a digital identity, a national digital identity, we call it SingPass Mobile, which allows uh, citizens to transact digitally with both the government and the public sector. So you can make available important information. Uh, for instance, I can use my SingPass Mobile to allow a bank to onboard me without the need for paper documentation of physical presence, because all the re requirements for know your customer and customer due diligence will be, provide, will be done through verified data uh, through SingPass Mobile, which establishes authenticity of my identity. The second layer is authorization and consent. If you wanna foster public confidence that digital transactions are safe and secure, we need mechanisms for individual consent to ensure that the use of data is properly authorized. So you need to build into your architecture a authorization and consent framework. And they also ensure transparency in how data is used. And that is used and shared in accordance with the purposes for which it was provided in the first place. The third foundational infrastructure is payments, interoperable electronic payments infrastructure. And almost for, for almost any digital transaction in the economy, uh, you need a payment. So you need to have seamless payments in both digital to digital and digital to physical environments, which means you need common payment rails or networks, and you need interoperability across payment solutions. And this is what some of the big tech players do not provide because they are walled gardens. They are like islands, which has a large ecosystem, but they're not interoperable. 
And this is something that we've been working on and many countries have been working on in providing this kind of retail payments infrastructure. Many central banks have started work on this and particularly in this region. Uh, in Singapore, we call it FAST. And on top of FAST, we have a what we call pay now, where the customer, the individual will link his bank account number to his mobile number or his other, another identity number. And we can use that to make payments. Um, with just three clicks on the mobile phone, you can send money to another person without knowing that person's bank account or bank app or, or which bank he is with. As long as you know the mobile number, you key in the amount and you confirm. So that is the payment rail that enables and it has been wonderfully liberating uh, for financial inclusion because it brings a large number of lower income people and small and medium enterprises who are able to make payments. The last layer of the foundational digital infrastructure is, um, is the ability to exchange data. Now, this is the most challenging part. And this is where the big techs have um, and on their platforms. You, we need to break those up so that data exchange is interoperable. Aggregation of data is possible and the benefits of aggregation are possible, but by not having data monopolization. And the challenge lies in empowering the individual uh, for control over his data. So individuals and businesses, you must be able to digitally access all their relevant data and make them available uh, to a third party service provider who can then serve these individuals and businesses in a holistic way. In Europe, we call it uh, open banking. Um, and for purposes of financial planning, um, third party service providers can have can be granted access to your financial data, which is currently fragmented across different institutions to aggregate that data, to provide more meaningful, more customized and comprehensive financial solutions. But doing that in practice is, is quite challenging. Uh, we've done that with uh, what we call the Singapore Financial Data Exchange. It's a data exchange platform um, which uses the national digital identity and a centrally managed online consent system to enable citizens to access their financial in information held across different financial institutions and government agencies, your tax records, your pension information, uh, investments, insurance policies, bank deposits, all that information fragmented across many places. Very difficult to pull that out. But SG Findex allows you to use your mobile phone use a consent architecture to pull that information together so you can actually see all together. You can actually construct your own balance sheet, a personal balance sheet of your assets and liabilities across everything. And you can seek financial advice. And the financial advisor is able to give you meaningful, holistic uh, advice based on all the information available. So we've got to keep looking at how our digital infrastructures can be made interoperable. And the next challenge is how to make it interoperable across countries. And this is one of the things that uh, uh, we've been working with uh, our neighboring countries in ASEAN, um, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and so on. With Thailand, we've already got a prom pay, pay now connectivity, which links the domestic payment systems between the two countries. So what I just described about being able to pay another person, knowing just that person's mobile number, you can now do it across the two countries. And we've got to keep expanding this. But linking payment systems bilaterally is very complex and expensive um, and very hard work. And so we must look at ways in which we can multilateralize cross-border payments in a more scalable way. And I think this is where the BIS uh, innovation hubs do a great job. And the hub centers in Singapore and Hong Kong are exploring how payment systems can be linked together to enable faster and cheaper cross-border payments. And there's strong synergy between this work and the broader work I've described about foundational digital infrastructure. And um, we've been very happy to work with the BIS Innovation Hub uh, in exploring some of these integration efforts. So I'll just end off here by saying that um, one of the key ways in which central banks can enable financial inclusion, digital inclusion, is by providing some of these foundational digital infrastructures. Uh, sometimes in collaboration with other government agencies and definitely in collaboration with industry and then seeking to connect them so that you can create 
truly global digital public goods, to use the phrase from the BIS. Thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you, uh, Shamsia. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, Ali, may I call upon you to share your Thank you. Thank you, Shamsha. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, ASB and also the BIS for the uh, invitation. Uh, and I enjoy a lot of the presentations uh, made by the uh, speakers before. Uh, in particular, uh, the, the, the keynote made by Professor Burton, because uh, I feel like I'm going back to uh, school again, hey. because 25 years ago, I was actually a student of Professor Merton learning uh, option pricing from him in Harvard. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really glad that uh, he was his, his, his using option pricing to talk about a forward looking uh, forecast, which I, I, I benefit a lot. But since uh, what I understand from uh, what, what I know in finance actually mostly came from Professor Merton. So I'm not going to comment on his remarks. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, is to just offer a few comments on uh, three areas, uh, mostly made by uh, Henry and uh, Fernando and partly by uh, Rafi just now as well. Uh, first is about CBDC. And I agree with uh, Henry that CBDC has great potential to change the global payment landscape, to facilitate cross-border payments and also to improve uh, financial inclusion. Uh, in fact, the HKMA started piloting uh, the wholesale use of uh, CBDC a few years ago, uh, for mainly for cross-border payment. And this has now turned into a project uh, named Mbridge uh, under the BIS Innovation Hub that uh, Ravi just talked about. Uh, and it's also jointly done with a few other central banks like the People's Bank of China, the Bank of Thailand, and also the uh, Bank of UAE, Central Bank of UAE. And the progress is very encouraging uh, the pilot platform that was uh, uh, already in train uh, last year has already proven its ability to cut the cross-border payment process from normally like three to four days into just seconds, almost real time. And also to cut the fees. Very often you see the fees for cross-border remittance going all the way to six, seven percent of the amount. And now uh, the pilot proved that it can cut the cost in half. Uh, so the pilot will continue through this year uh, using real transactions from 30 odd uh, financial uh, institutions around the four jurisdictions. And after that, uh, I'm hopeful that it can become a production ready uh, platform. And also this platform is built with very high technical flexibility in interoperability, which I think is very important in thinking about any new technology uh, so that um, any other interested central banks can easily join this new platform, uh, whether they adopt the same CBDC typology or even when they don't use CBDC, they can actually join using their traditional uh, RTGS systems. And we are hopeful that with more central banks joining in, uh, it could potentially become part of the solutions to provide fast, cheap, and also trusted uh, cross-border payments. So we do have high conviction that CBDC holds great promise uh, for wholesale use like cross-border payment. But what about retail? Uh, we're actually going through a study uh, and uh, to, to look at Hong Kong dollar and we expect to come out with a report by the middle of the year. In fact, we've already published a technical white paper. But the more difficult issues for us are actually the various policy and legal issues mentioned by Henry. Things like the impact on the financial system, uh, privacy, traceability, security, AML, and other legal considerations. But apart from these, for us, the customer needs and also the user case is also important. In a city which is already very well banked, in fact, we're overbanked, and we've also got a very diverse and efficient set of retail payment instruments already. We're asking ourselves whether there are really sufficient use cases to justify the rollout of the e Hong Kong dollar. And we're actually talking to banks on possible use cases that we may not see before, that may not be well served by the current payment uh, instruments, uh, but we, we, we're still uh, uh, exploring that with them. So I think it's a lot more delicate in the uh, retail side. The second comment is about data, which Ravi mentioned, which I fully agree. Uh, data is very important, especially with the advance of AI and other data analytics. We do believe that good use of data can help promote financial inclusion. 
uh, especially the very long-standing problem of SME financing. Uh, as you all know, for a long time, it's been extremely hard for SMEs to get trade finance loans or working capital loans for business expansion, uh, mainly because banks often do not have sufficient uh, data and information to assess the credibility of the SMEs. And the SMEs also find it hard to produce some of the financial statements like cash flow or ba even balance sheet that the banks require because they don't, some of them don't even produce one. And they end up always have to either provide uh, collateral for their loans or cannot get the loans at all. And to solve this problem, um, the HKMA uh, is now building a new data infrastructure that we call the Commercial Data Interchange or CDI, a bit like the SG Findex that uh, Ravi talked about, but not exactly the same. Uh, what we want to do is to enhance the sharing of commercial and government data through one common data platform that we are building as a public good. Currently, every time that a, a bank wants to connect to any one data provider, they have to set up a new separate bilateral connection, which again is costly and, uh, and time consuming. But with this common platform, in future, each bank and each data provider will only need one single connection to this common platform allowing banks to very quickly access the whole range of the business data of their client this, at the SME, ranging from trade declarations, turnover uh, in the online platforms, POS terminal data, uh, or digital identity that Ravi mentioned, or even tax information. And these are all previously what we call scattered digital islands with no connection. And what we are trying to do through the CDI is to connect all of them and smoothen data sharing, of course, with the consent of the corporate. And with that, the SMEs can take control of their own digital footprint and use their own data to improve their own access to financial services. And last year, together with the bank industry, we've already piloted the platform. And the result is very encouraging. We've got a lot of real transactions already going through. Uh, and the SME feedback is that they are getting cheaper and faster loans. And we will formally launch the CDI platform towards the end of this year. And with more banks and more data providers joining the platform, we are hopeful that data will become the new ingredient that can help oil the SME lending machinery. My third comment is on regulation uh, that uh, Fernando talked about. Uh, and I fully with, agree with Fernando that regulation has to catch up with the fast evolving technological developments. And there are two areas that I think are extremely important uh, to think about regulation uh, and we have to catch up. Uh, one is on big tech that uh, Fernando has talked about and I fully subscribe to what he was, uh, to his observations, especially the part about uh, international cooperation. And second is about crypto and uh, crypto and crypto assets and stable coins, which are fast emerging. And there's been a lot of discussions already at the FSB and there's already a consensus, like Fernando said, about the need for the regulation of payment-related uh, stable coins. And the HKMA has, a few weeks ago, also issued a consultation paper along similar lines. But crypto encompasses a very wide spectrum. And I think FSB probably should accelerate its work on, for example, unbacked crypto assets and decentralized finance as well. In this regard, and also in collaboration with the other regulators in Hong Kong, like the Securities and Futures Commission, uh, we have just issued two circulars just today to detail our guidance on how regulators and entities should handle crypto-related business, like trading for clients, custody, uh, how AML or investor protection should be built into their operations, etc. cetera. Um, and before I close, I would just like to um, mention one challenge that we often experience in promoting the use of technology uh, in solving some of the banking, uh, uh, long-standing banking problems. And this is about adoption and how best to scale up the platform. Very often the technical work to build a platform is actually not as difficult, but getting people to adopt and use it is challenging. Faster payment or instant payment is probably an exception. It, it, the adoption is very fast in most jurisdictions, but not necessarily all new platforms. For example, when we launch a new blockchain platform called E-Trade e Connect uh, to digitize the whole trade finance process four years ago, 
the take-up rate was rather slow because the inertia to change, uh, both from the banks and the SMEs, was actually far greater than we thought. But when we come to the CDI that I just mentioned, the response from all the stakeholders has been a lot more encouraging, forthcoming than I thought, mainly because there's something for everyone. For example, uh, when using the CDI, the banks can better risk manage um, their loan, SME loan exposure using data, uh, whereas the SMEs can get loans cheaper and faster and the data providers can generate new revenue from the data that they own. So there's something for everyone. So in thinking about building new technology highway, I think it's also important to engage the stakeholders early so that when you design the business uh, model, one might need to think about building in incentive for early adoption. Uh, at times, a gentle regulatory push, in my view, will also be an effective nudge to get banks to adopt technology because the inertia is always there. So it's important to put across quite a forceful message to all stakeholders when we push technology that we all have to embrace change, try out, be ready to change our mindset, be ready for new processes. And then eventually the result and the reward will be a win for everybody. I'll stop at that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, very interesting indeed, uh, the developments in Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, so we now move on to the fun part of the session, the Q&A. Uh, and I've been asked um, to moderate the Q&A based on the number of likes of uh, the questions that have been posed. So um, I thought of you know, invoking my privilege as a chair and put my first question. But when I look at the list of questions, there's a lot of questions. So I think I'm going to go direct um, to the questions that have been posed. So the top liked um, question is from former Governor Patrick Monaghan. Hi, Patrick. So the question is directed to Henry. Uh, uh, Patrick is asking whether there has been much pushback uh, to the introduction of the Swedish CBDC, or whether it has been from banks or from the politicians. Henry, would you like to take on that question? Mm -hmm. I would uh, put it uh, this way, uh, that uh, the banks are not enthusiastic uh, over an introduction of uh, a CBDC. The politicians, it's a different thing. Uh, before the pandemic, I traveled a lot uh, around the country, different meetings, meeting people. Uh, many of those who I met thought it was strange to have a negative policy rate. So that was a very a question I got very often, uh, why we had that. But most people were in fact, enthusiastic over the introduction of an uh, electronic corona. Uh, it uh, uh, there's a pretty strong uh, popular support for the introduction of, of uh, uh, a CBDC. For some people, it has to do with uh, that they don't like banks and they want uh, an alternative way of, of uh, 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 making their payments, uh, not using uh, banks. Other people are um, concerned by uh, of using cards uh, with respect to, to personal integrity. So, so what I felt from the political system is that they are also sensitive to... to uh, uh, the public support for an electronic krona. So, so in a way, I, I think that um, they, uh, some of them would like to participate in the de decision to, to introduce uh, a CBDC simply be because uh, it has some popularity. So, so um, um, uh, in summary, uh, the response is mixed, but, but um, uh, many people uh, like the idea. Right. Um, thank you, Henry. So the next question is from Suryana Jumali. Um, in pursuit of reaping the benefit of digital payment, what are the pertinent configuration factors in successfully designing CBDC that coincide with the current payment infrastructure? 
without undermining monetary and financial stability. So I'm going to pose this question um, to, again, um, to Henry uh, and Ravi and uh, Eddie, uh, whose organizations have been uh, involved in uh, some of these uh, CBDC uh, proof of concept. So Henry, can I call on you again uh, to, uh, to answer this question? Then after that, Ravi and Eddie. You know, um... Already when we have entered the digital world uh, within the financial markets, uh, that in itself has created uh, issues for financial stability, even before CBDCs are, are introduced. Uh, and nowadays, it's very easy to move money from one place to, to the other. So, so even without CBDCs, we can have runs uh, on uh, individual banks. Uh, I think that, um, on the other hand, this creates incentives. Uh, uh, the fact that you can be threatened by, by a bank run against your financial institution might uh, create incentives for you to act more carefully than in, in uh, old times. So, so, so uh, uh, th there might come some discipline uh, out of it. Uh, I, I'm not at all sure that the introduction of CBDCs will create enormous problems uh, for financial stability. If dig a digital world uh, creates such problems, they are already here. So I stop there. Ravi, may I invite you to share your thoughts on this question? Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks, Ramsia. Um, now, Henry is right. Um, and I, I would um, maybe take it up from there to ask um, what is the problem statement that we are trying to solve through a CBDC, right? Uh, and as Henry said, it's, it is not trying to solve the problem of digital payments. We already have digital payments. 95% of money today, money supply today is in the form of bank deposits, which are basically digital money because it is a bits and bytes computer code that records how much you have. And you can move that money from one bank account to another bank account with all the mechanisms that we discussed earlier on. Um, so money is already digital and electronic by and large. And in, in it's possible, and we're already seeing that in Sweden, uh, the use of physical cash could continue to decline to the point where you could have 100% uh, digital payments economy. No CBDC comes in there. So what is the CBDC about? Uh, Eddie mentioned earlier the distinction between the retail CBDC and a wholesale CBDC. The problems that we have solved successfully are domestic payments. We have not solved the cross-border payments problem. So wholesale CBDC, where both central banks issue a wholesale CBDC into a blockchain that links the payment and settlement systems across the two countries, uh, serves a purpose. Because unlike domestic payments, where a central bank is a central counterparty, in a cross-border payment, there is no natural counterparty. And that's where you need a blockchain or a distributed ledger. So wholesale CBDCs come into play then. Is there a case for retail CBDC? Some countries would say no, because we already have uh, digital payments. And in other countries, they would say, well, I think people still want to hold in the form of cash a liability of the central bank. So when you hold cash, you're holding a liability of the central bank, even if 95% of your money is a liability of a bank. Now, I think in some countries such as Sweden, they are judging that this is something that we need to provide people because people require it. Uh, in other countries, uh, they may make the, uh, a different assessment that this is something that people may not desire. Um, and I agree with Henry, the problems or the challenges to monetary and financial stability already exist with electronic money as we know it today. Uh, CBDC just adds a different dimension. So that is not going to be a major factor. The bigger issue is, do people want to hold a digital form of cash that is a direct response uh, liability of the central bank? That is the big question. And it's as much a political question as a monetary question. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Andy? Uh, I'll just add a few uh, additional uh, remarks. One is uh, on monetary and financial stability. I agree with both Henry and uh, Ravi, that the problem is always there. Uh, and in terms of, for example, some people worry about very quick migration 
uh, if you've got CBD, CBDC. Uh, and, and one way to solve it is to use account-based uh, token uh, and also impose limits on it. And that will also partly solve uh, some of the issues about AML uh, and, and KYC. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of whether one should uh, uh, roll out retail uh, CBDC, I thought the circumstances in different jurisdictions are really different. Uh, it depends on where your starting point is. For example, as I mentioned in Hong Kong, uh, we've got already very efficient and diverse retail payment landscape, ranging from uh, credit card, debit card, uh, store value card, uh, faster payment, everything. Um, and so is there a use case plus there's actually no dominant player. So if you've got a landscape uh, where you've got only one or two dominant uh, payment uh, player and where you're worried about the systemic risk, if these one or two player uh, is going wrong or whether they could exert monopolistic rent on the public, then you might need the central bank to issue CBDC. But in, in Hong Kong, for example, you know, we, we've got many, many different uh, competitors. So I thought, the uh, issue of competition is not there. So uh, again, I, I, I agree with the others that uh, it is partly a, uh, uh, not, not just a, a, a technology issue, but it's also a, whether, whether there's a use case for it uh, and, and, and in thinking about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. How about you, Fernando? Do you like to weigh in on this question also? Oh, you're on mute, uh, Fernando, again. Now it works. No, I think I agree with the remarks made before. I think it's important, actually, uh, just to combine the two elements I think Ray mentioned. First is mm -hmm. to understand what is the social, actually, demand for CBDCs, what type of services people expect CBDCs to provide that cannot be provided now by other, by other instruments. And very importantly, to stress that where there could be a very clear business case for a CBDC is actually to facilitate cross-border payments. That's absolutely key. I think Ryan mentioned before some projects of the, of the BIS Innovation Hub in that domain. And this is, of course, a, an important area of attention in, in some of those projects. I think it's key. We have a problem with uh, cross-border payments. And there is a good hope that uh, CBDCs could actually help solving them. Okay. Thank you. Right, um, the next um, question, um, again, uh, is directed to Henry. Um, there's a lot of questions uh, directed to you, Henry, because of uh, how advanced uh, Risk Bank is uh, in respect to the CBDC. So it talks about the offline transaction. CBDC transfer may require the internet to verify transaction. I would like to know what are the well-received solutions to support offline capabilities. And perhaps the next question also, about uh, e-corona, if it were to be issued with interest, how would Riggs Bank manage the CBDC in negative interest rate scenario, particularly in managing the mass or retail? Would the value of e-corona depreciate and how would uh, the central bank possibly address the possible backslash of retail participants? So these are really technical questions. Uh, both of them are, uh, studied in the in the pilot studies and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you will get short answers here but but uh, I also refer you to to the reports we have published and, and very soon there will be a new new report but but uh, basically if you look for an offline solution you you you, you seek ways of finding uh, seek ways of storing the information about the payment so that you can settle the payment uh, later on. And mm -hmm. then you need to have some kind of collateral in the system so, so, so that people uh, believe in each other. But, but uh, fundamentally, uh, we are looking for technical ways of, of storing pay payment uh, information. And if you find ways to get people to trust each other, then you can settle uh, these things uh, later on. So, so it's a question of uh, technology, but it is also a question of, of uh, trust. Uh, 
it's uh, similar questions uh, regarding negative uh, interest rate. I mean, you can think of if you want to get an electronic krona, you, you need some time to go to an electronic ATM machine. And, and uh, you know, like the way you withdraw cash, you withdraw an electronic uh, krona. And of course, you, you, you can introduce a fee at that uh, moment if, if you want to introduce it. Whether it's desirable or, or not, to have interest, uh, 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 that's another question, and, and uh, that is the value judgment. But but uh, there are technical uh, solutions. We are looking into them. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we have found the optimal solutions, but but uh, this mm. is uh, along the lines uh, the people working with technology are, are looking. Okay. Uh, Ravi or Eddie, uh, do you have any perspectives to share? On, on these two questions? No, no, not quite. <laughs> right, okay. All right, so the, the next question is directed at you, Fernando. Uh, it's from a anonymous attendee. Uh, with respect to the argument of stable coins having implications for monetary policy, the Fed study finds no evidence of any change in overall banking balance sheets uh, in strictly domestic setting. Uh, money raised from stable coins going back, going as backup in banking products. What could be the factors that can cause a negative interaction of stable coins with the financial institutions? Are you on mute again, Fernando? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's because I'm not used to WebEx or to this type of <laughs> these days. Joker, of course. No. Um, yes. Uh, of course, we cannot actually sort of attach too much weight the existing evidence on, on stable coins and in particular all stable coins because the new phenomenon and of course we cannot actually sort of uh, judge the prospects of um, of the introduction of this type of payment uh, instruments uh, just on the basis of what we have read so far huh? what uh, what we do know is that there is a potential uh, that we do generate important risks we are talking about you know promise uh, or sort of an instrument which somebody promises to be able to convert into convert it into something like fiat uh, currency at request of the of the user so that implies actually that for this instrument to to be successful of course there should be trust that this is going to happen in any, in any circumstances uh, if there is no sufficient guarantee for this to happen of course you could actually have runs on on these stable coins and this may actually generate important systemic distress um, in, a, in the international context, you could think even that if the stable coins are really successful, well, you could consider that uh, those global stable coins becoming actually the standard payment instruments in other jurisdictions. Eventually, people would like to have their wages and prices be denominated in that particular, uh, particular new currency, and therefore, this generating a currency substitution process. Mm -hmm that could damage uh, monetary sovereignty. So there are a number of risks there. Uh, that's the risks which are now being studied by uh, global standard setting bodies, including the FSB. Also, it's actually the subject of this important, interesting report, important, important report I mentioned in my intervention by the by the US Presidential uh, Commission on this, on this matter. And this justifies why, in particular, in the US, apparently, they were, what uh, uh, public officials are actually proposing is a tough, relatively tough and stringent approach under which only uh, depositor institutions, say banks, should be able uh, actually to issue this type of this type of instrument. But in any case, the issue of stable coins, I think, is a good example of the need to combine both regulation and the provision of public infrastructure. Because it's true that some versions of global stable coins could actually contribute as well, actually, to solve this problem that we have with cross-border payments. So while we need to use regulation because at the same time stable coins are generating some that, that many risks for the adequate functioning of, uh, of payments and, and eventually for monetary uh, sovereignty and financial stability, since we have to we have to regulate that as now it's been proposed, particularly in the US, at the same time, we cannot actually ignore that uh, we have this issue about cross-border payments. If we don't want actually global stable coins to be the only possibility to solve this issue, the mm -hmm. problem, we better actually put in place some sort of an alternative. An alternative could actually be something like, you know, sort of uh, interoperable CBDCs that could actually help conducting cross-border payments in a much more efficient 
and cheaper way. I think that will be extremely beneficial from many points of view, including financial inclusion, being that obviously a, a core topic of this conference. Mm -hmm. right. um, thank you, Fernando. If I uh, may continue on that line of question and answer by Fernando, Ravi, I recall that MAS did issue um, a report on a retail um, CBDC uh, in the Singapore context. And if I can, if I recall, uh, when I read the report, it highlighted that uh, you did say that the issuance of the digital Singapore dollar uh, could be means uh, to mitigate the risk of uh, currency substitution uh, from stable coins and foreign CBDCs. Uh, and the risk of that uh, is assessed to be small for now. So perhaps you can share with us uh, what are the indicators that uh, MAS is monitoring to assess the risk trajectory um, are there any specific thresholds where the issuance of retail CBDC would be eminent? Yes, uh, thank, thanks, uh, Shamsia. Um, the, um, I think what uh, pri private cryptocurrencies in general and stable coins are a particular form of cryptocurrency, which is, of course, stable and supposedly stable in value. Mm -hmm. The main advantage that they have um, is that they are actually tied to a platform uh, where, and they are integrated into that platform. So it becomes easy to use that currency as you transact through that platform, as you buy goods, services, and you navigate that platform. I mean, that's the main uh, proposition that Facebook provides because everybody is on that platform. That currency, the currency they provide there has a compelling advantage. Now, but money is not only about, you know, being able to be transacted across a platform. It is also about stability of value. And stable coins try to combine both advantages, the advantage of fiat currencies, which are controlled and managed by central banks whose value is managed, and the pervasiveness of use that a platform provides. So in that sense, a stable coin is actually a, potentially a strong competitor uh, to fiat currencies. Now, and if you look at small economies, emerging economies especially, it is not inconceivable that a stable coin can substitute for that currency, especially if the currency is not managed well and uh, people find the use of the stable coin on the platform so compelling. Um, and the stable coin demonstrates that it is able to hold its value against a specified fiat currency. So we were thinking that as a potential threat to monetary sovereignty of a country uh, where you have currency substitution. Now, it is again not new. There are countries which have currency substitution uh, where, say, the US dollar is used predominantly because the US dollar is seen as holding value better and is also seen as being able to be transacted more widely uh, for wider purposes. So you have a dollarization of the domestic economy. And that poses challenges. With stable coins, that is a potential. Uh, but we regard the risk as being rather small today. I mean, the ability of a stable coin to combine these two advantages of stable value plus pervasive use on a platform is still not very clear because the question arises, what is behind the value of a stable coin? In the fiat currency, in the fractional reserve system that we have, a bank deposit um, is, in a sense, backed ultimately by the central bank. The money that is created is backed by the monetary base. Now, of course, not every dollar that you put in your deposit is there sitting in the cash vault, right? It is lent out. But the monetary base and the central bank standing behind it provides that backing and confidence. With a stable coin, it is not clear who provides that. The, the value proposition uh, is that these stable coins issued are fully backed by high quality securities. And we've already seen instances in some, in some places in the United States that some of these claims are unfounded, that the securities are not there or the securities are not as secure as uh, you make them out to be. And there is a view in some regulatory circles that in the absence of a central bank, the only way a stable coin can be fully backed is to have 100% backing in AAA securities or, or fiat currencies. And that destroys the business model because then you, you can't operate the way a bank operates, uh, which is a, through the credit multiplier. So 
I see some inherent um, um, difficulties and challenges for stable coins to take off. And that's why we said for now, the risk looks small, uh, but we don't know how things will pan out in future. Uh, we did not expect these things 10 years ago. So I think we need to keep our options open. And therefore, although we don't see a need to issue a retail CBDC, uh, we want to be prepared to do so if necessary. And so we want to master the technology, the platforms, the governance, the policies, the whole range of issues, which we've done for wholesale CBDCs over the last six years. Um, and now we're embarking on that uh, uh, for retail CBDC, a retail, uh, a digital Singapore dollar, for instance, but no plans as yet to issue one. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Thanks, Ravi. Um, Eddie, uh, how about you? Would you like to weigh in on this stable coins and um, the risk that it may pose to domestic uh, financial and monetary stability? Well, uh, in fact, we put out this uh, consultation paper uh, just a month or so ago. Uh, mm -hmm. The way we look at uh, the uh, stable coin is very similar to uh, the store value facilities, uh, the store value payment instruments that we are now actually regulating uh, mm -hmm. through a, uh, our legislation, which I think many other jurisdictions yes. uh, have it as well. Uh, basically, it's a blockchain uh, version of store value instruments. So what we want to make sure is that if they are behaving like those instruments, then the regulatory framework in terms of, for example, that the operators have to be fit and proper, uh, that the uh, assets that they claim to have been invested in high quality uh, instruments are really there. Uh, somebody is auditing it, like Ravi mentioned, it's not like disappearing overnight, uh, hurting the, uh, the, uh, the users. Uh, we need to make sure that the AML controls are there, operational resilience are there because it's part of our payment system. If it's popular and suddenly it breaks down without you know, knowing it, then uh, the confidence to the uh, payment uh, system or even the financial system uh, could be threatened. Uh, the uh, threat uh, of currency substitution is something that we uh, also look at, uh, but um, our view is very similar to uh, Ravi, which is uh, it really ultimately depends on the confidence of your people on your currency. Yes. Uh, you know, with or without stable coins, uh, yeah. you know, either it can flow out to other currencies or it can flow out uh, of your territory or jurisdiction anyway. So it doesn't make that much difference. But the important thing to us is really uh, sort of treating them like a payment operator. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I think that will bring us to the end of the session. Uh, and I would like to thank everyone uh, for tuning in today and for the engaging um, session. I would like to thank the speakers and the panelists for providing their insight and for all the good questions that have come in. Uh, if I were to sum up the sessions in all the speakers have emphasized the importance of maximizing uh, the potential from digitalization uh, by making things interoperable, uh, providing public goods, and for us to see if CBDC uh, can help on, on this front. And the importance of regulation uh, to keep up with uh, the fast changing developments uh, from big tech to crypto. So uh, as I close, I would like to thank everyone again and have a good evening. I guess uh, all good things must come to an end. Good evening, uh, good afternoon, good morning. I'm Eli Ramalona. I'm a professor of finance and, uh, and the director of central banking at the Asia School of Business. Um, as you know, this has been a truly interesting conference. It's a kind of conference that uh, makes you feel intelligent after it's over. So for that, I'd like to thank uh, the driving forces behind the conference. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Seti Assis and my former boss, uh, Augustine Karstens of the BIS. And uh, for all the fun we had tonight, I'd like to thank uh, Governor Shamsha for uh, being so good at nudging the speakers. I'd like to thank uh, Bob Merton of uh, MIT. Uh, um, I'd like to thank uh, Henry Olson of the Riggs Bank, uh, Fern old friend uh, Fernando Restoy of the FSI, and uh, my old friends uh, Ravi Menon of uh, MAS and uh, Eddie Yu of the HKMA. Uh, thank you 
Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Good night. Thanks.